We serve as co-chairs for the Heritage Life Committee, which puts on student government's three main events throughout the year, pilgrimage to Penfield, Christmas tree lighting, and today, Founders Day. So we work together to get these events um, started and work on finding speakers and arranging all the details that go along with that. We plan it from pretty much from start to finish. We're really honored to have the judge here this, this year. Please remain standing while the uh, Vice President of our Student Government Association, Mr. Ike Ikeke, brings our invocation. <clears throat> Let us bow our heads to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our others for their debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for allowing us to assemble together this morning. We thank you for our speakers, for our guests, our administrators and staff, faculty and students, all that came this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your peace reigning, your wisdom flowing, and your love being shown throughout this message. We thank you for keeping us, Lord, this day. In Jesus' name I say, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Please be seated. It's a privilege to welcome you to our annual Founders Day celebration. It's a special privilege for me to welcome our guest, the Honorable Yvette Miller, who will be introduced to you shortly. Welcome, Judge Miller. Thank you so much. Today we gather to celebrate and remember the founders who have gone before us. We remember those who brought this university into being more than 175 years ago. We see their names as we walk across campus, Mercer, Sherwood, Penfield. That same walk through campus reminds us of the founders of subsequent generations, Bell, Dowell, Roberts, and Godsey. The Mercer that we know today would not exist but for the impact that they had on this place. The course of Mercer University is not fixed as it moves through time. Each of us who pass through this place contributes through our actions to what Mercer will become. In this sense, we are all founders of Mercer. The contributions of Mercer's faculty, staff, and students today will be as important as those of prior ages. Each generation leaves its own unique imprint on this community. Our contributions to Mercer as we walk this campus will make us the founders of the Mercer of the future. As we begin today's celebration, I want to thank Matt Hickman, Molly Davis, and the rest of the Heritage Life Committee of the Student Government Association for organizing and sponsoring this gathering. I now invite Dr. Doug Pearson, Vice President and Dean of Students, who will share remarks about the meaning of Founders Day. Following Dr. Pearson, we will proceed in the order of our program. Good morning. It's with pleasure that I get to address you once again as the uh, Dean of Students about the meaning of Founders Day. I want to thank the Student Government Association for again hosting this great event. This past fall, I was meeting with several student groups about uh, some policy interpretations, when one of them remarked that they thought Mercer should uh, loosen things up a bit. Come on, they said, we should liven it up. It would be like the old days. The old days. Now, I'm not quite sure what old days they were referring to. But for fun, just for fun, I decided when, when I went to archives this year, particularly since we were having an appellate court judge as our speaker today, 
that I would look up some of the original rules governing student behavior in the old days. And this is what I found. It was really quite interesting. First of all, and I'm not sure how many of you know this, but they kept a log of, of student infractions. They included religious transgressions, infractions of the rules of daily living, delinquency during academic hours, and, now hear me students, infractions during farm work. <laughs> that's right, that's the good old days we're talking about. Now student academic violations were not too surprising. They included disorderly conduct, inattentiveness and tardiness, reading borrowed compositions, being unprepared to speak, and idleness in study and labor. But I particularly like some of the chapel violations, and University Minister Craig McMahon, you might want to take note of this, that not singing, persuading others not to sing, <laughs> and singing in disorder were all violations during the good old days. But as the dean of students, you can imagine, I was, I was most interested in the conduct infractions that included sleeping in another's room, pillaging the orchard on Sabbath, <laughs> keeping arms and gunpowder in student rooms, and using curse words, and I apologize in advance for this, for dast, god dast, damn, dern, and doused. Now, apparently, there were many food-related issues back then, as students were expected to, quote, avoid waste and leave a clean plate. Yet, despite this rule, there were students trespassing in the potato patch, <laughs> po possum hunting without leave, fishing on Sundays, and, of course, my favorite, beating the hogs while eating. <laughs> I'm not sure if it was beating the hogs that made it bad, but they were doing it while they were eating, but it was an infraction. And for those of you that keep pestering our poor president for changes to the alcohol policy, please note that no student could bring wine or intoxicating liquor to the campus, and that going to the grog shop and getting drunk were violations of the policy in the old days. But if one can read between the lines, one can deduce that the alcohol policy was probably violated from time to time back then. The evidence for me included students being cited for falling asleep before nine o'clock, refusing to work, sticking pins in boys at church, <laughs> indignities to the ladies at the mill pond, and at least one case in which a student was found, quote, naked in the main road. <laughs> it doesn't say for sure, but I think the last one was grog related. <laughs> the old days, you see, Sometimes looking back gives us a better perspective on both the present and the future. That is why Founders Day, an event that was first held in Mercer in 1891, was brought back by the Student Government Association in the 1960s. It provides prominent alumni a chance to reconnect with the institution and to tell us what it was really like in the old days. But it provides us with an opportunity to pause and reflect on who we were, but more importantly, who we are and who we want to be. That is the meaning of Founders Day. Thank you.
thank you, Dr. Roberts, for that musical performance. Uh, the Mercer Singers did a wonderful job, as always, and we're glad you can make it here uh, today. Good morning, everyone. Um, on behalf of SGA, welcome to Founders Day. My name is Matt Hickman, and I am this year's Heritage Life Co-Chair, along with Molly Davis. And I have the special honor this morning of introducing you to our speaker. Um, our speaker this morning is a double bear, earning her undergraduate degree from Mercer in 1977 and her law degree in 1980. Since then, she has become one of the most influential people in Georgia and has continually raised the bar in both her personal and professional life. Judge M. Yvette Miller currently serves as the presiding judge of the Georgia Court of Appeals, but before that, she um, served as the first African-American um, chief judge of the, of the Circuit Court of Appeals um, from 2009 2011. She earned the privilege of chief judge by serving on the Georgia Court of Appeals since 1999 when she became the first African-American woman um, to serve on the court. Since then, she um, has won two six-year statewide terms, which were uncontested. Honorable Judge Miller has not only been the first African-American woman to serve on the Court of Appeals or as Chief Justice of the Court, but she has led a lifetime of firsts, including being the first African-American winner of, the Miss, Ma of Miss Macon, one of the first female prosecutors in Fulton County, and then becoming the first African-American attorney to practice law in Jessup, Georgia, and throughout the Brunswick Judicial Circuit. Throughout her career, she has earned several honors, a few of which I would like to highlight for you all today. Um, in addition to earning several awards by the Georgia Bar Association, she is a trustee for the university, was, award, was awarded the Meritus Service Award by the University Alumni Asso Association, and in addition, she is um, on the Board of Visitors for the Law School and is the recipient of their Distinguished Alumnus Award. Further, she was presented with the Pinnacle Leadership Award from the Delta Sigma Theta Th Sorority, was inducted into the Gate City uh, Bar Hall of Honor, and was named Who's Who in Law, Who's Who in Atlanta, Who's Who in Black Atlanta, and was designated as one of Georgia's top 50 influential black women from 1999 to 2008. Please help me extend a warm welcome to um, our alumni and our speaker, um, truly re remarkable Mercerian Honorable Judge Miller. Thank you so much. It is indeed a pleasure and an honor to be here this morning. Mr. President, members of the Board of Trustees, faculty, staff, members of the Platform Committee, students, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure and an honor for me to be asked to speak here today on Founders Day at Mercer University. I want to begin by just taking a few minutes to thank those special guests of mine who have traveled here today to be with me. First of all, I would like to acknowledge my mother who has been an ardent, ardent supporter for just a few years. Not, not quite as many years as listed in the program, but for a few years. But <laughs> at, at any rate, I also want to acknowledge several law students uh, who have come to join us, some church members, and I really want to acknowledge uh, a real Mercer star who we're expecting great things from, Mr. Langston Hall. Would, would you just stand, young man? And let's give them all a round of applause. <laughs> Langston's mother is a friend of mine and uh, he comes from a fine family and they live in Lithonia. And we are expecting a win this Friday night. Okay? And I smell a conference victory. So go Bears! <laughs> I would also like to extend a hearty thank you to, to Jordan Locke, who is the president of the Student Government Association for all of his assistance in supporting me and helping me get here today. Now, I would like to begin by reflecting on the university's history, highlighting its numerous accomplishments and articulating a vision for the future. So today's theme is raising the bar. We must celebrate the accomplishments of the founders of yesterday. We must maximize the opportunities of today. 
we must also prepare for a dynamic future. A future that will no doubt pay big dividends by increasing the quality of your lives. When you receive a good education, you are prepared to achieve and excel in your chosen vocation or profession. You have the values, the principles, and the intelligence to enjoy your life and to contribute to the lives of your family members and the greater community. We are assembled here today to pause and think about these things and reflect on your bright futures. In the early 1800s, Josiah Penfield, a Savannah jeweler and a philanthropist who believed strongly in education, gave a contribution of $2,500 to the Georgia Baptist Convention to begin plans to open a school in Penfield, Georgia with 39 students. It was named after Jesse Mercer, who was not only the first chairman of the Board of Trustees, but also the backbone of this institution. Now remember, this was a small Spartan type of school, not anything like uh, the school that you're privileged to attend today. And the school was born out of a desire to educate the young men who would be the leaders of the Baptist churches throughout the South. At that time in 1833, women, African Americans, and other minorities were not considered. In 1837, the Georgia General Assembly granted the Mercer Institute a charter which elevated the Mercer Institute to Mercer University and solicited the relationship between Mercer and the Georgia Baptist. In 1871, the Georgia Baptist Convention, in a very informed vote, uh, decided to relocate Mercer University from rural Penfield to the thriving city of Macon, Georgia. Now, as we look back, Mercer, like so many uni universities, was started as an institution of very humble beginnings, which because of great leadership has developed into a first-class university with world-class facilities and top-notch students. And before I say anything else, I need to acknowledge that, that I see some of my professors here. <laughs> And it feels mighty good to be standing here on my home turf at Mercer University and know that Dr. Brown is still over the philosophy department. <laughs> and so many others are here that have trained me and put the fear of God in me and helped me to be the person that I am today. And I just want to just stop and say thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, students, you may say, why is it important to revisit these well-known historical facts on this Founders Day? Well, I would submit to you that if you don't know the history of an institution, then you cannot judge how far that institution has come since, since its inception. If Jesse Mercer, who contributed one-third of the school's total endowment by 1840 and later bequeathed most of his large, substantial estate to Mercer University, and Josiah Penfield and others had not founded Mercer University, then we wouldn't all be sitting here today, would we? The Mercer story is an important story for you to know and for future generations of students to discover. It is hard to appreciate the founder's level of sacrifice and success if you never look back to see how things got started. The vision of Jesse Mercer in conceiving this university as a boys preparatory school has been matched only by the vision and the dreams of the outstanding presidents of this university. 
Dr. Rufus Harris was Mercer's 16th president. And he was leaving as I was about to graduate. He was responsible for establishing the Mercer University School of Medicine and so many other accomplishments. Dr. Godsey, the 17th president's leadership, brought tremendous growth in the number of colleges and schools and properties and facilities. The Mercer University Board of Trustees named the historic administration building on this campus, the Ara Kirby Godsey Administration Building. Just since 2006, Dr. Underwood, his leadership has already brought a tremendous increase of over 20% of the student body population, as well as the possibility of another wonderful school <laughs> that will be very important to the state and nation. And we're on the, the prefaces of so many other exciting changes. This is a wonderful time to be a Mercer student. So today, Mercer consists of a comprehensive university system with colleges and graduate programs, major campuses in Macon, Atlanta, and Savannah, and regional academic centers throughout Georgia in the counties of Douglas, Eastman, Henry, and Noonan. Mercer offers undergraduate and graduate degrees in liberal education with professional, professional disciplines. Mercer is also the second largest Baptist affiliated institution in the world. Today, as it always has been, the goal of Mercer University not only is to advance the economic interests of its graduates, but also to advance the cause of a free society by ensuring that its citizens will be well educated and prepared to give back to the community. Why should this matter to the student body today? Well, because the Mercer story is your story. Today, Young women, men, African Americans, all people are included and embraced in this educational plan. Today, as a nation and a state, we know that we are stronger because of our diversity. You young people are the leaders of tomorrow. Your generation will be the next group of successful people, including doctors and lawyers and journalists and teachers and professors and engineers and scientists and ministers and business people. I believe someone in this room will be a future senator and a governor of Georgia. There may be future pre a future president of the United States in this group this morning. There may be some student here today, a scientist, who might be able to come up with the cure for cancer. Someone here today may make the idea of life on the moon and other planets an ordinary or a commonplace notion. For all I know, we are training a world-class athlete that will go out and compete and bring home the gold. Who knows? As this university looks forward and continues to raise the bar, and raise the standards, I envision dreams that will come true in the future. I see a world-class, increasingly diverse faculty and student body of national and even international distinction. To ensure that th these dreams become a reality, we must continue to prepare our students to compete and to contribute locally, nationally, and internationally. We must continue to teach and provide our students with ethics and a sense of purpose. We must continue to strengthen our libraries and other facilities with a focus on technology. And to do all these things, we must have the courage, the determination, and the faith which will be necessary to secure the financial resources. And we've done it in the past, and we will do it in the future. As we discuss Mercer's future, it's especially important for me to mention the words of the former president of South Africa, Nelson Mandela, 
who said, and I quote, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Now, I cannot share all of that history with you without just telling you a little bit about my personal story uh, while I was here at Mercer. So I was here a few years ago. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I can remember graduating from Northeast High School and I had such high hopes and I had been admitted to several colleges and universities. And I decided to come to Mercer. I was thinking that I was going to come for one year and that I may very well transfer to another state since I'm a Mercer, a Macon native after my <coughs> freshman year. But during my first year at Mercer, I became involved with the Student Government Association. I was elected freshman class president and became the first African American and first female freshman class president. And I made a lot, I had a lot of friends here and I grew to love Mercer. And I conducted my campaign right outside of my uh, dormitory, which was at Roberts Hall. That was my headquarters. <laughs> so my freshman year was a successful year. So at the, as, at the summer, I moved back home and um, I talked to my parents and, and I sat down with my father as I often would and he said, well, what about next year? You had a good year, what, you know? So, well, I'm thinking, I, I, I had talked about transferring, but I'm undecided. He said, well, but you were, you know, in student government, you were elected president. He said, I think that they need you there at Mercer. And I said, Daddy, you may be right. And I really do love it. And so I went back to campus and I never gave it a second thought. And I'm so thankful for that. <laughs> he was a pretty smart man. <laughs> By the way, did I mention that during this time period, the African American student population made up less than 5% of the student body? During my four years of student government at Mercer, part, well, part of my legislative initiative was to get Wonderful Wednesday reinstated. Do you all remember Wonderful Wednesday? <laughs> and we were successful. Do you still have Wonderful Wednesday? Okay, that's probably a good plan. <laughs> but we pushed it through and it worked. <laughs> I'm proud of the fact that I participated in so many student faculty initiatives. I was the campus news editor for the Mercer Cluster, always trying to get the big story everywhere on campus. I was in a sorority, Delta Sigma Theta. In my junior year, I became a resident advisor, and so I was, lived in freshman women's dorm, and it was a wonderful experience of being responsible for 20 plus women having grown up with no sisters. It was pretty interesting. And one of those young ladies who was on my hall is now one of the most outstanding law clerks at the Georgia Court of Appeals. So the friendships that you make here are incredible and they will last a lifetime. And during my senior year, I was elected president of the senior class. I had fun, I learned a lot, and I just can't say enough about my time here on the campus. We, I love going to the basketball games, and the fraternity parties were pretty good also. <laughs> I had some terrific professors. Uh, I have to call the name of Dr. Cox, who used to be the chair of the political science department. He was wonderful. I also have to say thank you to Sam Hart and to Dean Joe Hendricks for encouraging me always to stay the course and to keep striving. The professors here always placed an emphasis on raising the bar and maintaining high standards and having high expectations for me and for all of the students. My years at Mercer were some defining years in my life and I am so proud to be a Mercer alumnus. Mercer produces a great product, if I don't say so myself. Just look at some of the outstanding alumni 
The Mercer story is one of a fine tradition of excellence. These outstanding alumni have raised the bar. I'm reminded of one in particular, Judge Griffin Bell. Judge Bell graduated from Mercer's Walter F. George School of Law. He was a legend in his own time. I could not wait to meet him. I got to really, I thought we were friends. I mean, I loved him. He was a United States Circuit Court Judge for the Fifth Circuit. He was the Attorney General of the United States, serving under President Jimmy Carter, and a partner at the prestigious law firm of King and Spaulding in Atlanta. Judge Bell is and, and always will be one of my heroes. He was also one of the nicest people I ever met, and he spent time with me. And I truly regret that he's not here today to continue to mentor me. Recently, I, I was at a luncheon talking with Ambassador Andrew Young, and we were discussing the federal judicial process. And he just happened to mention to me how he missed Judge Bell. And I was shocked. I didn't know they knew each other. But he said Judge Bell was such a big help to he and Dr. King during the 1960s civil rights movement. And you know, it would not have been possible to have had that movement without courageous federal judges and a courageous Attorney General of the United States of America. I would like to also mention another one of Mercer's alumni, who I think the world of, Attorney Frank Jones. Frank is a dear person. Frank was responsible for overseeing the integration of the public schools in Macon, Georgia, following the landmark Supreme Court case of Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954. It took a long time for Brown versus the Board of Education which was decided in Washington, D.C. by the Supreme Court, to come to Macon, Georgia. But it would not have happened without the persistence of a Frank Jones and Judge William A. Boodle. I think of Bob Steed, a funny man, a humorist, an author, a distinguished attorney at King and Spaulding. And yes, while an undergrad here at Mercer, he was the editor of the Mercer Cluster. And so when we found that out, we had a lot of laughs and jokes about back in the day. I also would like to recognize Dr. Mary Wilder, who was one of the first female professors at Mercer University, who single-handedly, with her zeal and tenacity, encouraged and served as a role model for so many women. I'm reminded of Leah Chanin. She was an outstanding female role model, and she was one of the first female uh, professors at the law school. She was a sharp dresser, and she was bright and intelligent. And she held her own as the first and during my tenure only female professor when I began law school. I think of Judge William Augustus Boodle, who died at the age of 102 in 2005. He served as the former dean of the law school, and he ordered the integration of the University of Georgia, admitting Charlene Hunter and Hamilton Holmes. I also think of Carl Vincent. Do you know who he is? He was a powerful congressman. He served from 1914 to 1965. He graduated Mercer in 1902. I also think of Walter F. George, for whom the law school is named after. He was one of the most influential and powerful senators in America. Of course, I think of Georgia Governor Nathan Deal, who is the 82nd governor of Georgia and a double bear. He is leading this state forward during these difficult times. The Mercer story is a remarkable story of success. And Mercer alumni have had a huge impact on this state and nation. In the end, though, Mercer is not just about notable people whose names or works you may be familiar with. It's about all of the students who studied here, those who have graduated and been transformed into productive citizens who have helped shape our society. We are raising the bar high to encourage you 
to rise up to meet your goals and to master the challenges you will face in life. We have helped make Mercer what it is today, a university that cares about education and that cares about its students. So let us not forget, Mercer University is a special place. It's a place of opportunity and hope. It's a place where academic curiosity, yes, is encouraged and fostered, where academic excellence is a priority, a place where students' experiences can and do make a difference. So what a huge legacy you students have to reflect on. I challenge you, the students at Mercer, to raise the bar by always doing your very best. You can achieve whatever you can conceive. I challenge the faculty and staff to raise the bar at Mercer so when future generations of students matriculate here, they will have a first class experience that this university has become so well known for. And as we celebrate Founders Day for 2012, let us go forward and continue to raise the bar. God bless each of you and God bless Mercer University. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Jordan Locke and I'm currently serving as the president of the Student Government Association. I've had the pleasure of helping plan Founders Day for four years now. And I'm very proud to say that this year's ceremony has been one of the most exciting. Students, please join me in once again thanking Judge Miller for speaking this morning. <laughs> Founders Day is an event that is rich with tradition. As a senior, I can honestly say that it means more and more to me each year. Today is a day that does not end with this ceremony. I challenge each student here today to take the thoughts and ideas shared during this hour and think about them when we leave this place. It was Jesse Mercer who said, the most fruitful source of error is ignorance. The ideas that you cultivate here at Mercer, the knowledge you accumulate, the opinions you form will undeniably help shape your life's course. Whether that course takes you to the Georgia Court of Appeals or whatever your aspirations, I encourage you all to take advantage of your time at Mercer and expose yourself to as many new experiences as you possibly can. Thank you again to Judge Miller for inspiring us this morning. The Student Government Association will be presenting her with a token of our appreciation on behalf of the student body at a luncheon to follow. Thank you, Lord, for your grace for this day. You always give us enough to get through. Help us to remember your faithfulness and not our own troubles or inadequacies during hard times. Thank you today for Judge Miller's encouraging words of reflection. It is her example and that of other alumni that inspire us to excellence and dedication in all our works that we pursue. Help us to go out from this place today and follow Judge Miller's example of perseverance as we strive toward the works that you have placed in our hearts to pursue. Help us to number our days and run with endurance the race marked out for us. Give us grace and enable us to go forward from here to better this campus, Macon, and the world. In your name, amen. Listening to her story and where she came from and how she accomplished it, it's very inspiring to me. And like, I don't even know what to do now. I thought she was really inspirational and it was cool that she had won so many awards and had just paved a really amazing path for all the women at Mercer. I believe it's important to look back at the history of the college, you know, to, you know, try to prepare for the future and do better things. It's just really motivational and inspiring because I'm planning to continue my education. She did it here at Mercer. I'm trying to go to Mercer as well. So it's just, you know, an extra push to keep going and to raise the bar. I thought it was really great that um, the students were able to see someone who really has accomplished what she set out to accomplish since her time as a Mercer student. I liked what she said about how you don't, like you have to know uh, an institution's past to understand where it's going and like 
where it's leading to and I really like that she said that because I feel like some people forget just how far Mercer has come and how great of an institution it is and the legacy of excellence that Mercer has and how it still continues today and we are that next generation of great leaders. Mm -hmm.